Welcome to TESOL Kuwait's podcast. I'm your host for today, Ann Newman, and we'll be talking with Dr. Shahed Ashamri. Dr. Shahed Ashamri is a Kuwaiti writer, academic scholar, and assistant professor of English language. She's well known for her research that focuses on human and women's rights, disability issues, and recently, illness narrative. She has authored six books, and she's a popular keynote speaker around the globe, covering topics in the fields of literature and culture. In 2019, she was nominated for the British Council Alumni Awards for Social Impact, and in 2021, she won Outstanding Monograph of the Year from the National Communication Association. Dr. Ashamri obtained her bachelor's in English language and literature from Kuwait University, and she was awarded a master's degree in English studies from the University of Exeter. And finally, she was awarded her PhD in English from the University of Kent. In addition, she's earned a TEFL certificate from the University of Toronto. Dr. Shahad Ashamri was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis at the age of 18. From then on, she learned never to give up and she continued her education. Her parents have played a huge role in encouraging her to earn her place in society and help disabled persons achieve the same. Her mother refused to believe that her daughter deserved special treatment which resulted in Dr. Shahid Ashamri growing to become fully independent, even in dealing with any form of pain. Consequently, owing to the encouragement of one of her PhD supervisors, Dr. Shahid Ashamri delved deep into the field of disability studies to better understand her struggle with multiple sclerosis. This too helped her discover her path in academia and creative writing. I invite you now to sit back, relax, and listen to Dr. Shahid Ashamari. Dr. Ashamari, thank you so much for joining us us here at TESOL Kuwait's podcast. I'm really excited to have you here. Uh, I know that you're a well-known author, a, an excellent educator, but I want to know about Dr. Shad, the child. <laughs> what were you like as a child? Um, first of all, thank you so much for having me on Tisla Kuwait's podcast. Um, I'm really excited to be you know, talking to you today. And it's a really great question to start with. And I think yeah, it's a question that everybody can actually sort of reflect on. I really think that who you are as a child, your experiences have a lot to do with, you know, where we end up, how we end up. Um, dealing with other people, what we choose to do with our lives. And I think as a child, I always knew I wanted to write and I wanted to read. I wanted to write and read, read out loud, you know, be in touch with people through reading and writing. I didn't really think I'd be an educator. I just thought, you know, I'd be a writer and I'd be talking to lots of people. And, um, you know, I always looked at authors as as uh, masters of language and of storytelling. And I really wanted to be, you know, that, that kind of magician that plays with words. And I think I read a lot of, you know, stories. I, you know, hung around people who would, would read. You know, I, I had a lot of um, fascination with librarians and libraries libraries and bookstores in Kuwait. And I think that really shaped um, how I I grew up to really, really envision um, a life only with books and, and stories. So yeah, I hope I hope that kind of answers it. Uh, but it is something for all of us to think about how we raise our kids today is also important because that really does shape an entire future. Yes, if you do not read to your children, I wouldn't predict that they will be readers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I want to know you're an author and you're a literature professor. What sparked your interest in language learning? 
So I think, uh, you know, like every reader, once you start falling in love with stories, you also start looking at language. And for me, stories were the only place uh, that I felt like I really could belong. Um, and I, I don't just say that as a cliche. It was really a place of belonging. It was a finding place. Um, I had, you know, to speak Arabic at home, but school was, you know, private American school where we were speaking with American teachers, native speakers. And I was trying to balance the sense of uh, identity. So stories gave me a way out. I wasn't caught between two cultures or between two languages. I was starting to find that there were lots of characters, you know, that felt like they couldn't belong. So they created their own, uh, you know, their own their own understanding of life. And so as I as I grew up, I started realizing the stories weren't just stories, but it was how we use language to communicate, uh, not just with other people, but with ourselves, you know, how we make sense of loss, how we make sense of pain, how we make sense of life. We do it only through, you know, the usage of language. It's that really powerful tool. And once I began to understand that, I really began to feel the need to pass that on to other people, too. It, it was like I found uh, sort of like the meaning to life, that it was how we used language and how we told stories about ourselves and, and others. Well, uh, so I'm sure that you see an intersection between literature and language learning in terms of enhancing language skills. Is this true? Did yes, you? absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And I think you would agree. Um, you know, I learned quite a lot from you, too, about how how I can actually work with uh, stories and, and uh, language. So initially, we sometimes come to uh, literature from this very almost elitist perspective of, you know, it has to be the classics and it has to be, you know, complex words and, and complex uh, narratives. But when you're trying to use literature in an, in an you know, AFL classroom or you trying to teach English, you're also looking at what language is being used, how we can actually use stories to spark interest in, in, in a language that can sometimes feel not just foreign, but really difficult to lots of our students. And uh, for me, I found that, you know, even just a simple short story, nothing that's too complicated, a simple short story can spark an interest uh, both in language and in culture. So it gets them to think about how we can actually respond to what we've read using new vocabulary, using um, a new uh, techniques that we've learned throughout the story. And I think because, again, literature is all about um, us, in a sense, it's all about the reader more, more than anything else. It kind of helps the students uh, gain interest in language and also reflect on the usage of language. So not just the, you know, the mechanical part and the grammatical part of studying language, but also how we can use the similar vocabulary or similar language to start uh, communicating about what we really need to be communicating about. And uh, I found that throughout, you know, all of these years teaching that it's really a, a great way to get students, you know, to, to show interest in language through any sort of narrative, through a poem, through a short story, um, through even um, movies, uh, music, lots of different ways. And it all seems to be more, you know, interesting and more relevant to them. Yes, um, I remember once doing <laughs> with the literature class, Daisy Miller goes to Saudia. And it, <laughs> it was an interesting interpretation. <laughs> now, what inspired you to devote yourself to teaching EFL literature? Because we don't usually think of it as EFL because so many of the students that you teach and I teach also, when I was at the Faculty of Medicine, they mm. are just almost, and many of them are, uh, bilingual. Yeah. So we don't get, but actually, this is literature for EFL students. So what inspired you to devote yourself to teaching EFL literature? And what aspects of the subject do you find most rewarding? 
So I think, uh, especially with the AFL literature, you, you, it's a full on process. It's a commitment on, you know, the part of the educator, but it's also a commitment on, on the student's part more than anything. And it is a very difficult space to, to navigate. I think it takes, uh, people who really are, uh, multicultural in, in, you know, their, their thought process, uh, multicultural in their approach, um, to, to teaching, to, uh, to, to listening. And EFL literature specifically, uh, I found to be very student centered. I was also working with how they were responding, not just to language, but also uh, to the text. And what was really re rewarding was seeing them not just learn new vocabulary, but also uh, be able to kind of develop some sort of critical uh, thinking skills and um the critical thinking skills, I could tell, was kind of like a light bulb m moment for a lot of them. Uh, you start the semester with, you know, with a lot of struggles. The first problem is always, you know, why should we do this or why should we read or uh, this is um, going to be very difficult for us. But then when they start mastering the, the ability not just to read, but also to connect to a text, so that usually felt very, very re rewarding for me. Because it was such a hard process. Um, it demanded a lot of creativity. It demanded a lot of uh, thinking outside the box. I needed to, to learn to teach in different ways so that I could kind of elicit some sort of, um, some sort of response from them. And so that I could get to the goal of teaching, you know, critical thinking skills plus a mastery of language. And I think it's one of the most um, difficult jobs to 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 really work with. Uh, like you said, we get a bunch of students from different backgrounds, but usually this is a difficult batch uh, to work with, and it does take a lot of commitment. And um, and I think once I started, uh, you know, teaching, I started learning too. I I came at this in a very completely you know different mindset, thinking everybody's going to know what I'm talking about, and everybody will love, um, you know storytelling and, and narrative the way I do, but I realized that that was a very limited view. And as I began to explore different ways of teaching, I also communicated with lots of different, uh, lots of different teachers who employ different methods. Um, I looked at how you teach, I looked at how other people teach, and I realized, you know, you could learn from from every single one of these educators and develop your own sort of technique after, of course, listening to others. And I think as educators, we tend to go in with a very uh, rigid mindset, but that doesn't work, especially with our students. You need to be flexible and, and kind of, you know, um, shift gears as, as you go along, as you, you get a different batch of a semester. Um, some of them will do very well with vocabulary. Others will do very well with uh, role playing. Others will do very well with the uh, dramatization of, of texts. Others won't. So, yeah, I, I learned quite a lot and I've dedicated myself to it because it's been such a rewarding journey. Often I say everything I learned was from my students, especially yeah. when it comes to the Internet. Yeah. <laughs> you, have you found your students helping you to develop your methodology for teaching them? I think so. Um, again, I came at, at it very differently. Initially, when I first started teaching, I, I thought there were very specific methods uh, to work with. And as I started talking to them more, I was also listening more. So I think a big part of this is as uh, educators, especially in the AFL classroom, we tend to be uh, speaking more than, than listening. So when I started listening to them, a lot of them started saying, you know, we really would like to do more group work. And I initially wasn't very sure about that. I wanted to make sure that I was uh, leading the class. So I think I started off with a uh, instructor approach rather than a student-centered approach. But then when they started saying, we'd like to do more group work, um, can we uh, create uh, something of a sort of like a performance, a play, instead of uh, just, you know, reading the text and analyzing it? So I think I've learned quite a lot from them. And um, they're also very uh, tech savvy, of course. And there's a lot of uh, familiarity with pop culture uh, references that I'm not aware of. 
Um, so I started also asking, you know, what's new out there? So I'd bring in a classic text or a classic poem, and then they'd say, actually, there's a remake of this text into this movie, or this poem has been rewritten from a different perspective. Uh, there's a bilingual, uh, you know, writer who's writing back. And all of that just meant that I had to also learn to to become a better listener. So absolutely, I think there's a lot uh, we can learn from them. Okay, well, in your opinion, what makes a study of EFL literature valuable for our students who are learning English as a foreign language? So I think um, we do really need to incorporate uh, more literature, more drama into the way we we teach language. And I think this sh this should be across um, across the board. We tend to to um, forget that at the end of the day, the study of language is a study um, of life. It's a study about how we use language to communicate, not just with others and for specific purposes, but also with ourselves. Uh, so being able to communicate, being able to label a certain feeling, being able to label uh, a certain conflict and to, to do it, you know, appropriately. Um, we are handing them these tools more than anything. So, so the study of um, language is is, is pretty much everything that these students actually need to succeed, uh, whether they go into business, whether they go into uh, the corporate world, or whether they want to go into social media or sell a product. Um, everything they need is going to be connected to how they end up um, accepting the language and embracing the language. And most of the time, there's a fear of the English language. Uh, if not a fear, there's a sense of, uh, you know, feeling like it's too rigid or, you know, looking for the the right grammatical perspective, the mechanics of the language. But what literature does or when we try to dramatize uh, certain texts or when we use role play, uh, when we read uh, aloud, when we use different, different techniques um, to tell a story, it really does get them to have a bit more interest. You can see the spark you know, taking over in class, you can see um, them actually trying to to use similar language to tell us it's a similar story or to respond to characters. So rather than having no investment in a, cer a certain sentence or in a very specific vocabulary uh, um, chapter, you're looking at a story. And like all human beings, once there's a story, there's a sense of empathy that's being developed. And once you develop empathy, you also develop an, a really high level of interest. So learning the language, I feel really, really goes hand in hand with storytelling. And if we started that pretty early, from elementary or, or even earlier, then then English or you know language will just be part of the way we live our lives. Nothing that's alien. It's it's just a part of how we live our lives. Well, you alluded to you know introducing the text and all, but could you expand a little more on how you motivate your students to engage with challenging texts and to develop their critical thinking skills, which to me is one of the most important benefits of studying literature, critical thinking skills. <laughs> Absolutely. And, you know, that in itself, you know, a lot of people uh, struggle to define that simply, critical thinking skills. Um, again, you know, a lot of our students come to us with a fear of uh, with a fear of the language, a fear of uh, literary texts. And it's, it's very hard to motivate them when they're afraid. Once you start with that sense of there's a fear, then it's hard to get past that. So I think for any educator, um, I do this in my classrooms, and I know a lot of uh, educators who do this. First, we start with um, cultural relevance. So even if you're teaching Shakespeare, you can make it yours. So sometimes when I teach Shakespeare, the first reaction is, you know, we don't care. <laughs> and how is this going to be relevant to us today? This is, you know, some dead author, and it's not somebody that we can relate to. So we stop right there. First, I listen to them. I mean, it's always the first uh, reaction to actually listen. And then I start talking to them about cultural relevance, which means as an educator, I have to be well read, and I need to be able to make these connections for them. 
So they don't actually make the connection initially. There's, um, a, I think, a huge burden falls on the, the educators' uh, shoulders. I start with saying, actually, there is a lot of relevance to um, between these two different cultures. Y your culture isn't as different as you may think from 16th century uh, European culture. And their reaction is always a kind of like a shock factor. And, you know, what is she really talking about? Um, so cultural relevance works as a theory because we are trying to get them to empathize with the characters. But we're also trying to get them to think about how they can actually benefit or how they can actually um, become better individuals in society. So I get them to role play. So we always, always actually read the text out loud. Um, they, there's pre-reading activities where I give them some background on who is the author, why are we even talking about this author? And I always begin with the question of, so what? So what we have to study Shakespeare, so what we have to study Milton or all these names that they couldn't care less for. So we start with the so what, and I tell them that by the time we finish the reading, there's uh, after reading, post reading, you should be able to answer so what. What did we get from what, you know, what we've read throughout um, a week or two or three? Um, so pre-reading helps uh, spark interest. Um, they start thinking about what uh, could actually be the whole point of this. And I always start with the premise that, yeah, you might have a point. This is something that could be irrelevant to you. You might be right, but you could also be wrong. So I sort of play along with this idea of, yes, it's not exactly the most interesting thing, but you will benefit from it. And that kind of sparks their interest because I'm sort of playing along. I'll go along with them until we get to the text uh, itself. That's pre-reading. Once we start the reading uh, process, Usually we break things down into chunks. Um, so again, different passages are assigned. Then we go into uh, paraphrasing. So I will paraphrase with them. So on page 101, uh, what is the author actually saying? Can someone tell me? So it becomes very student-centered. There's a discussion going on in class. And of course, they're using English to respond. Um, I always tell them, use the vocabulary that you've learned in class. And I do a lot of modeling also. So I will say things like, uh, notice how I don't say person, I say character. Why am I doing that? And then I get them to kind of respond. So basically modeling the right language uh, or the right vocabulary to be using when speaking about uh, literary texts. And I get them to notice that as you speak, you need to be able to uh, also write that same way. So my writing and my speaking skills have to be very similar and they have to be good. But the only way I can do that is also if I listen to how other people are speaking. So once we get to the paraphrasing, we paraphrase together. Um, and I usually do uh, group exercises for that. So I'll kind of have a certain group paraphrase, another group paraphrase, another section, and then we'll go over together uh, in class. We get to the critical thinking skills after summarizing and paraphrasing. That's when we get to the big, so what? Okay, so what? Um, you know, this character has uh, ended uh, their lives or so what? What is the author actually saying? How is this culturally relevant and how is it relevant to our lives? Something that happened in the 16th century, it's fiction, it's not real. How can we actually find that connection? So sometimes I'm met with, you know, complete silence and, you know, I'll say we still have a lot of time keep thinking, uh, take a few wild guesses until we actually get to an idea. Once we get to an idea, I keep digging. So I'm always prompting for more. Uh, so what uh, the author wants you to think about, for instance, uh, death uh, or identity. How do we feel about that? How do different cultures react to, to the idea of, you know, let's say uh, suicide? What does that actually say about the given environment, the given historical moment? So it's a full on um, session of, of really critical thinking skills, but also developing how how we speak about a text. So I hope that answers it. I think you might be still muted. 
what I really enjoyed was where you were talking about the classics and getting over to them. It is a classic because the human condition is the same today as 1400 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Although when we're when we're 18 years old, we don't necessarily think that. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> What strategies do you use to help students improve their reading comprehension and analytical writing skills? So with with the reading comprehension, I think um, I've also used audiobooks and I use a lot of um, the listening uh, techniques just for them to be able to sometimes read along. Um, a lot of times, especially with difficult texts, they will say we struggle with pronunciation we struggle with um keeping track of um, different paragraphs because they tend to be very long difficult paragraphs so i always say let's use uh, audiobooks uh, let's hear somebody else read it so i will assign the reading outside of class but sometimes when we get to class uh, i'll also read passages out loud i'll get somebody else uh, to, to read it and then we do a lot of annotation a lot of highlighting of certain vocabulary words um we we use a literature circle uh, depending on um, you know the level that I'm teaching, but sometimes we use a literature circle where somebody has to be um, the one looking for you know new vocabulary. So different roles are assigned to each group. Uh, somebody has to make the connections between different passages. Uh, somebody has to ask questions about a certain passage, so they come up with questions too, which means reading closely and digging for certain um, certain elements in the text, not just vocabulary, but for example, um, how is the vocabulary being used to, um, uh, to establish symbolism or a lot of figurative language, because we do a lot of, we don't just do language, but we also do figurative language, which is a whole other can of worms, because you're you're talking about more complex ideas that can um that can feel difficult for them but as i said there's a lot of uh, guidance throughout um you know throughout exploring any uh, difficult text but we also do group work so there's um me in the classroom as a facilitator as a guide but then there's also a lot of uh, group work um, I find that the uh, literature circle tends to work very well when uh, they are working with difficult passages because they also start building on different uh, strengths and weaknesses that they may have. Uh, so somebody might be really great with vocabulary, but somebody else is really great with making connections. And then we switch that role or the, these, roles, uh, these roles the next time around. So I make sure that it's not the same group um, dealing with the same kind of uh, roles every single time we look at a text. Well, and I think what we will do that TESOL Kuwait will do is we will provide a link for people to download uh, the literature circle, the different uh, roles that people have so they can use it. Uh, okay, the next question is, do you incorporate any technology or multimedia resources in your teaching of literature? If so, could you provide examples? So um, with especially with literature, there tends to be a lot of books made into movies, uh, sometimes uh, songs that were originally poems. So there's a lot of popular culture uh, references that I can actually use. And um, I tend to use uh, quite a lot of videos in the classroom, a lot of um, uh, YouTube, especially YouTube videos where somebody is responding to a text uh, by uh, performing a response. and kind of gets them really interested to see that there are other people who are still interested in something that happened you know hundreds of years ago and it's the text is still alive through different um different uh, multimedia and and pop cultural um uh, dimensions so i've also noticed that there's quite a lot of uh, different um 
ways that we aren't you know up to date with as educators yet that they're using so for example now um, i don't use tiktok but a lot of my students use tiktok for something called book talk i wasn't aware of book talk until they actually explained to me that this is where all the new books are actually at this is where you can find them you can find summaries uh references uh paraphrasing of a certain text um sometimes it, it comes into a different language all through book talk so i've kind of made myself um you know try to to get accustomed to all of these different uh social media technologies out there that they're using and i'm you know kind of still struggling uh to use but definitely with um, teaching language and literature, I, I really think that um, multimedia and also embracing these different uh, outlets can, can be really beneficial. It's exciting for them, it's visual, and it, it also kind of brings the, the text and the language uh, to life. It, it definitely makes it uh, more interesting. When I teach poetry, I again, I love poetry, but not everybody does. So now I've realized that I need to link poetry to music that they listen to. And I need to be able to say, you know, you already um, know poetry. You listen to music all the time in Arabic and in English. It's the same thing. It's exactly the same thing. You just need to be able to see the connection. So once I've said that, I've seen a bit more interest again uh, because I've made it relevant to to them. So, but the, the very bad part of being a teacher is we have to evaluate them. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So how do you evaluate the student performance in your literature courses? And what criteria do you use to assess their progress? So, um, with of course with uh, with language you're assessing language with literature you're assessing both language and literature there's no way around it and so the writing component is really 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 uh, important and i keep telling them that it's not as simple as yes i loved what i read and yay i'm so excited about it how do you say something do you say it well? Uh, what are the words that you are using to convey your idea? So definitely the way they write, the usage of certain vocabulary has to be there. Um, I evaluate them based on whether they've acquired the vocabulary or not. And uh, so that's number one, have you acquired the vocabulary needed to be speaking about a certain uh, text? It is a language after all that they need to learn. So they have to use certain words. Um, if you use a word that you shouldn't be using, you lose points. I always tell them you're not speaking to a friend, uh, you're using the language to sound like a critic. Again, that sounds scary to them, but I always tell them we're building vocabulary so that you can sound better, uh, so you can speak as a critic and think as a critic. So vocabulary first, but I always say, say little, but say it well. So I always try and kind of limit also their, um, their usage of words. Um, they don't keep repeating the same thing over and over again. So there has to be some sort of... Um, concise uh, uh, measuring of their ideas. Can they measure their own ideas? And then finally, we get to have they paraphrased the way they were taught to paraphrase. And again, they've had a lot of exercises. Um, one really important technique with language and uh, is, of course, paraphrasing. And summarizing is a great technique, which I think a lot of students still struggle with. So they'll give you a whole summary but they still won't be able to summarize in three lines. So I'll have like pages and pages of, of a summary of a certain text. And I always say, if you can't put it in three to four lines, then this is not a good summary. It's not a good um, it's not a good uh, technique. You haven't mastered it. So say little, but say it well. After they paraphrase, after they summarize, that's when we get to the critical thinking skills. Have they actually thought about the text through different perspectives? Again, that goes back to cultural relevance, historical understanding. Are they able to place the text in the right moment or not? Finally, I also do evaluate based on effort. So I might be one of the few ones out there who really think about effort too. So 
Is there any sense of creativity that's being used? Um, is there any effort? Can I actually see progress throughout the semester? Is this the same person who started the semester off completely confused and then is ending the semester with more vocabulary established and is able to use that vocabulary? If so, then they definitely get points for that. Again, I really feel like how we evaluate um, sh should be or ought to be on several different uh, fronts, and one of them should be effort. Thank you. Uh, well, how do you perceive the connection between language and identity, and how can language learning contribute to a deeper understanding of cultural identities? So I think for us, we tend to think about um, cultural identity and identity as, you know, just a very, very specific singular definition. But again, if you think, you know, with the way our students think today, um, a lot of them are embracing uh, multilingualism. Uh, their identities are a lot more fluid than ours are. Uh, so they will speak English at home, but they will also speak Arabic. There's a sense of identity being um more um, theirs rather than, you know, a cultural identity. I think a lot of them um, now see English as part of language, as part of their identity, and it's very hard to separate the two, which brings me to this idea of authentic identity. That's, I think, a very problematic word with our students uh, today. A lot of them are definitely more flexible than we are when we used to think about identity as being, so this is a native English speaker, this is an Arab speaker, this is an EFL learner, and so on. I think with them, there tends to be a bit more flexibility because of their usage of language in, in different parts of their lives. Uh, they uh, play a lot of video games that tend to be in English and in, in Japanese and all sorts of uh, languages that we can't keep up with. Uh, they also watch a lot of um, shows in English, a lot of shows in, like I said, in Japanese. There's a lot of anime out there. It's quite a lot of stuff that um, connects to how they think about their identities. And I think with that flexibility, then we can definitely think about language as um, not something ultimately foreign to them. Um, they, they are exposed to English specifically, but to a lot more, a lot more languages and cultures through social media and through, um, you know, uh, pop culture and through things that they're actually used to uh, that we're not. Well, <clears throat> multi uh, multilingualism is becoming increasingly prevalent in today's globalized world. How does this influence language, the language learning experience, and what benefits does it offer to language learners? So I think we really need to invest uh, in in, uh, in multilingual uh, education in general and multilingual communication. And I think this is because uh, this really ensures a bit of um, not just success, but more global success. So uh, everywhere you look now, uh, cultural competency is important and being able to understand different cultures. Um, even in business strategies, uh, being able to have a cross-cultural perspective. Um, when you see um, as English as the only approach or um, when you try to sell something uh, using only one uh, audience or one understanding of which audience am I dealing with, then you're lacking uh, cultural competency. You're, you're lacking different cultural elements that come into play, even when we're using um, that for advertising, uh, for customer support, uh, you know, big companies. It's really important for us to start really investing in multilingual communication more than anything. And I think uh, with the way that the world is headed right now, um, definitely there's a whole global um, force taking over and our students need to be capable of not just multilingual um, communication, but also really embracing that rather than us thinking about um, just having one language that you know, they're using um, in different places. Rather than that, we need to think about how we can actually get them ready for, you know, the job market more than anything. And yes, English is the most spoken language in the world, but 
um, there are other uh, effective strategies of communicating uh, with different audiences. So a lot of our students are actually, uh, they have an advantage being, you know, bilingual speakers. They do have an advantage, especially in, in, in the job market. Lots of times uh, people want a bilingual speaker. Um, a lot of my students go into copywriting and they're always asked, you know, are you a bilingual speaker? And again, this goes back to um, us really training them to, to be uh, really creatively embracing language. I want to close with asking your advice that you would give to somebody who's interested in pursuing in a career in teaching EFL literature. What and what qualities do you think are essential for success in this field? So I think number one, the commitment to the field is absolutely important because it can, it can be, um, it can be disappointing at times, but it's also. Um, actually requires you to be you know a creative thinker more than anything uh you need to be a lifelong learner you need to be willing to change your methods uh you need to be willing to change gears you need to be willing to think about uh, different techniques that you can use, even if you are essentially uncomfortable with them. So, for example, um, a lot of teachers uh, tend to be uncomfortable with using drama within the classroom for one reason or another. But uh, I found that this is actually something that works very well with our students. Um, so being able to accept that um, different techniques will work differently in, in different classrooms also means that you need to be a lifelong learner. So you need to be attending as many conferences as you can, uh, looking at new strategies. And uh, now with ChatGPT is out there and we need to really learn how to use this effectively. Um, so again, that we stay on top of the game. Thank you so much, Dr. Shahada Shimri. I really enjoyed listening to you and your advice. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Thank you for listening. Okay.